Welcome to Beyond the Pod, presented by SodaStick.com. Brunette, he moves, Brunette back in, he scores! Minnesota has upset the Colorado Avalanche! Andrew Brunette, the game-winning goal! Here are your hosts, the second greatest scorer in Gopher hockey history, Pat Micheletti. And the second greatest hockey analyst on this podcast, Brandon Molesky. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Pod. It's brought to you by SodaStick.com. Pat, um, we'll get to uh, one. Great to see you. Great to talk you to you. You And also. Uh, obviously some big Minnesota Wild news that we'll get to eventually with uh, the buyouts of Zach Parisi and Ryan Suter. But first, we're joined by the Director of Amateur Scouting for the Minnesota Wild. He's got a lot of work, uh, a lot on his plate coming up here with the uh, two first-round picks and five picks in the first three rounds. The Director of Amateur Scouting. Judd Brackett. Judd, thank you uh, for the second time for joining us on Beyond the Pod. Really appreciate it. Oh, anytime. Thanks for having me back, guys. All right. Talk talk about the past year for you. Obviously, you were uh, hired by the Minnesota Wild in the middle of a pandemic, uh, working a lot remotely. I- I'm trying to wonder just, you know, um, I obviously don't have the access to video and, and scouting that you do, but just I feel like I have less information about this draft compared to last year's draft, right. at least in, in terms of stuff I see online and highlight videos and you're kind of watching videos from guys playing two years ago as opposed to this last year. So ha- has this been uh, a, a tougher draft in terms of scouting for you this year? Yeah, there's no question. It's uh, It's been challenging for us since, and it's not just unique to the Minnesota Wild. It's everybody, right? Uh, there's minimal amount of games being played, uh, restrictions on travel, but uh, I will say uh, it's been great. We have really good resources, whether it be access to video uh, our level of communication, still getting some analytics uh, into the mix. It, it, you know, we, we're trying to get as much information as we can in a year where there's maybe a little less information. But, uh, you know, we're prepared. We're excited for next week. And, um, you know, like I said, it's not uh, it's not unique to Minnesota. Everyone else is dealing, you know, from the same deck. Is, is there a comparable, you know, to the kids coming into this year's draft compared to last year? Uh, in ter- in terms in of what terms of talent or you know you know that that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you know I think where you see the biggest variation year to year is maybe in that first round, right? Whether yeah. h- how how deep it is or or how many uh, players are sort of in that top tier or elite caliber. So I think drafts can be defined by by what's available in the first round, and then there's you know there's always depth. There's always really good players, and we're talking we're still talking about seventeen, eighteen year old, right. you know, young men that are still developing mentally, physically. Their games are improving. Maybe their opportunity or role on a team is changing. So you know that's what's great about the the NHL entry draft is you know it doesn't always have to be you know the person in the first round that uh, continues on to have a successful career. There's players that are going to make it in the later rounds too. I probably formulated that question wrong. Um, I'll I'll put it to you this way. Not the first Uh, time. Yeah, there there were guys that made it to the NHL a year ago um, who were drafted in the first round. Uh, I'm reading that, you know, this year, guys, you know, know, maybe could, um, but more than likely a year going back to junior or college or whatever, wherever they play, uh, what might be the best route. Yeah, you know the name of the game is still development at this stage, yeah. right? After the draft, you know it's it's not it's not about when you get there; it's about being the best when you do get there and and, and being prepared and and making this a career. So, uh, I I certainly think the limited number of games that players played this year will impact some of their development and might be a reason why guys aren't able to make that jump. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to long term. I don't think it's going to keep them from getting there, but maybe less are ready in in year one. What are the uh, strengths and the weaknesses of this draft compared to past drafts in terms of, you know, whether it's positions from forwards, defensemen, goaltending, depth of the draft, high-end guys? Uh, how yeah. does this one compare to past drafts in terms of, you know, the strength and weakness of this draft? Yeah, I think we'll I think we'll see even, you know, on Friday night, even maybe in the first 10 or 15 picks, I think you'll see a wide range of, you know, you're going to see defensemen, you're going to see goalies jumping in. There's, uh, you know, there's some top flight goalies in this draft as well. So, there are, there are opportunities and, and you know what, I think because of the limited exposure, um, you know, scouts might rely on, you know, the areas of their strength, maybe where they live or the players that they did see. So I think teams are going to take, you know, inventory internally and, and look at this draft maybe uniquely that, you know, we really have to know who we're taking as opposed to maybe taking some risk on a player they know less about. 
When you look country to country, uh, you know, with players, whether it be Sweden, Slovakia, Canada, you know, the U.S., um, is there been is there a country that this year is standing out saying, boy, you know, they've got they've got, you know, a top heavy list of players, you know, to, to choose from? I mean, you know, I mean, it, for for us, it's easy to to say Canada. I mean, they yeah, had a tremendous right. tremendous showing in Texas at the at the U eighteen World Championships, and you know, they did that without bringing any players from the Quebec League. So, um, you know, that that speaks certainly to the the not only the caliber of player, but also the depth they have there. It feels like we don't, you know, when we're in comparison to the National Football League, where they're just projections, and you have all these draft analysts. I feel like it's not as strong when it comes to hockey. Or at least maybe I'm not as knowledgeable with it. Uh, I, I want to get your what, what on the central scouting rankings. How accurate are these things? Do you ever look at them and go, "Man, is this thing just completely off?" Or do you look at it and go, "Man, these are pretty in line with what I would think." You know, it's, you know, we we rely we use it quite a bit uh, in terms of whether it's you know putting parameters on or an outline. Um, every team's going to then take a deeper dive into that list and whether it's their own uh, criteria that they have or what they value, or maybe, you know, where the, the, the depth in their organization is. So uh, I think, I think we'd all be surprised that the, the range of lists between teams and central scouting. Um, I think that's, that's part of what's so unique about the job is, you know, you don't necessarily know what each team covets. So you guys are 21 and 25, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, a little confusing because of Arizona. Yeah, right? yes. Yes. there's Arizona in there, and the, yeah. Um, I mean, at 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 where you're selecting, uh, depending upon if you keep the kit picks or not. You know, I mean, well, I guess we'll find out. Um, is it again the best player that that is there? Yeah, I mean, I think we are, we're always going to focus on on best available, but you know, there is a unique intersection too. It sometimes there are you know, needs or, or vacancies in your prospect pool. So that might, might create a bit of urgency with a, with a, with a different player. Um, yeah. But we're, we're definitely never going to, you know, we're not going to try and reach to fit a need, um, you know, trying to create roster composition through the draft is a, is, is something that challenge is very challenging when you're talking about 17 year olds. So they're going to continue to develop. It's going to be a few years before we see them. And by then, you know, what might've been a need might no longer be a need. Well, having those two picks, um, if if they're real, I mean, if well, I could ask it a bunch of different ways, but uh, would you consider trading to move up to get a player? Oh, we, you know, and, we, and we've done some exercises in advance of the draft, um, talking about scenarios, you know, maybe which particular players um, in that upper portion of the draft, if something were to happen, if they got to a point, would we consider moving? So we've, you know, and we've done it in reverse too. We've, yeah. you know, if, Hey, if, if three, four, five of these guys are still available, would we consider moving back? So that's all part of the preparation. We have to have some of those discussions in advance. It's, it's certainly hard to pull together last minute. So, right. you know, we do a lot of projecting and forecasting and, and, you know, n not a lot of it plays out, but uh, in case right. it does, we need to be prepared. Joe, this may be a long winding question that I don't exactly get to the point and phrase it the way I want to, but uh, kind of like I, I'm, me. I'm, yeah, I, I'm always curious as to how, how, how as a scouting staff, you, you, you try to get intel on other teams and how you avoid giving intel to other teams, right? Because if, if you have a player you like, you're going to have a scout out there watching them and the other team's going to see that you have a scout out there watching them. And if you're watching that player multiple times, maybe they kind of figure out, hey, maybe this team likes that player. So you, do you ever use any of that to try to get intel on other teams? And, you know, do you ever try to deceive other teams in any way, shape or form on players that you know you like? Uh, so yeah. They, so you make sure they can fall to you. Yeah, I mean, the goal goal number one is to make sure we're doing the work. Uh, so if we need viewings on players or we have interest in players, we, we have to go watch them, whether we give away, a, you know, our, our interest level or not. Um, yeah, there is a good little game of cat and mouse and trying to find some intel. Um, you know, it's it's tough because we're, we're gatherers and not sharers, right? We're like, we try to you know, be very private internally, but uh, also continue to talk with our, you know, whether it's agents or coaches or even billet families and, and get a sense of what might be out there. So uh, it's, it is, it, it is a challenge because you don't want to give anything away, but at the same time, you want to try and get as much information as you can. Uh, the consensus number one right now, it appears to be Owen Power, uh, big defenseman from Michigan. Uh, you know, obviously I've seen him play quite a bit, you know, covering, 
that part. Um, what are your thoughts on him and, and his development and, and his projections? I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough with his time in the U S and in a spot where I was able to travel this year. So I've, I've watched Owen for the better part of three years now with yeah. two years in the USHL and at Michigan. And, you know, obviously it's, it's easy to talk about his size and skating because yeah. they're the first things that jump out at you. But, uh, you know, the, the development in his game, I mean, as an underage to be the top scorer in the USHL and 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 jump right into college seamlessly, um, it, it really speaks to, you know, his two-way game, his recognition, his ability to skate. He's he's not just a, a physical package. He's a heck of a hockey player. All right, Joe, let's see if you're willing to cut open a vein for me here. All right, two-part question. Two-part question. Uh, biggest regret you've ever had at a draft. And then the second part would be biggest relief you've ever had at a draft. Maybe a, a player you were desperate to fall to you that did uh i mean i think the 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 biggest relief um was uh was certainly the year that we selected uh, elias patterson in vancouver uh we were having some discussions about uh about trading back and uh you know we still thought we had a very good chance at him had we done that, but uh, maybe we were getting a little too greedy also at the same time. So uh, that was a relief. Uh, biggest regret. Um, geez, that's a, t- that's, that's a tough one. I mean, there's so many moving parts at the draft. Right. Um, you know, biggest regret might have probably been uh, a, tr- a trade that kept us from selecting a player that, uh, that we really liked. I'll keep it. I'll, I'll keep oh, it. I'll, 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 I'll keep. I'll keep it at that. <laughs> uh, talk about. Um, you know, Pat mentioned the the possibility of one of your first round picks being traded because you have two of them, and you know, I, I think Bill Guerin could go anywhere this this off season. There's there's a lot of different ways you guys could go. As as a guy who you know puts your entire uh, year of work into the draft. And puts as much blood, sweat, and tears into the, you know finding uh, everything you can about these draft picks. Do you ever get upset when you get to that point and all of a sudden that pick's gone that you spend so much time uh, working for? Yeah, and there's and you know what? Every year there are players too that they might be in your range, they might not be in your range, but when they are selected, it has a little extra sting because you know that they were, you know, maybe players that really resonated with you, not just on ice but off ice. You right. felt like this is a guy we could win with and feels like he's a culture carrier and, and a guy that you know wants is going to be a, a winner in minnesota so you know though we always there's always players and some of them you know you don't have a chance at um but there's others that you sort of have earmarked all right hopefully this guy's still here at this point and and when they go it just has a little extra sting so um as far as trades though generally tr- trades we've we've either enhanced somewhere else um, or, you know, uh, you know, we've improved the team. So at the end of the day, it's a, you know, we're all here to win it. So however we get there, whether it's draft picks, whether it's trades, we're, we're, we're all on board the same way. How many picks do you have in this year's draft? We have five in the first 100, which is, uh, you know, something that I've, I've never experienced before. I'm, I'm thrilled about that. I think yeah. there's, you know, there's, there's, there's great depth in, in every draft if you, if you do your homework. So, we're really excited about that, and then we hold each of our, our fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. So this is a this is an exciting draft. Uh, we but, all know about Marco Rossi and what happened to him. Um, looking back at last year's draft, um, were you happy with the development of of those kids? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we you know Marco ran into his yeah. his health concerns, so I, I know that uh, shortened his season and and limited. But you know, the most important with with Marco is that he is healthy. Um, you never you know hockey was secondary when that news came out. We wanted to make sure he was healthy and back on track, and and you know and getting the the help and the resources he needed. So that was first and, and paramount for us. But uh, seeing him back on the ice and training and right back at it is is great to see. Um, I know the vigor that he has as a, as a young man and, and what his goals are. I don't, I don't think that anything's going to derail his, his progress. He'll get right back out there. And, but everyone else, I mean, uh, Ryan O'Rourke, I mean, the chance to play in the American hockey league for the year is, is, you know, certainly going to accelerate his development, expose him to 
pro hockey, you know, the, just the day-to-day habits, the practice habits, being around guys that are already professionals, that's, yeah. that's invaluable. And, and, and something that, uh, you know, as the captain, the Sioux, I think he'll take back there. And as, as an OHL team, they're going to benefit from, from that experience as well. Um, Damon Hunt had some experience, experience in the American Hockey League, but also as we saw his offensive game grew in the WHL, um, you know, Murat Kuznadinov, uh, you know, had a great year playing, you know, with some of the national team, but was sidetracked with, uh, with some injury. So development wise, I think, you know, and, and sorry, not to, not to skip over, uh, Novak, but again, another guy who had a chance to play internationally, uh, play against men. So, I, you know, for in a, in a, in a challenging year, I think, you know, our five players all had chances to play, you know, against men, uh, older competition. And, uh, and I think we're going to really see benefits down the line for it. You know, the fans in the media tend to focus on first round picks. And you mentioned, you know, the depth guys and having five picks in the, in the top, you know, three rounds. What, what's kind of your philosophy once you get out of the first round, maybe once you get out of the second round, you know, when you're getting a third, fourth, fifth round, are you just trying to find guys, you know, that can, can be on your third defensive pairing someday or be in your bottom six for your forwards? Or uh, I, I guess, you know, are you trying to find guys that have extremely high potential, but maybe a different range of outcomes? I, I guess... Are you a home run hitter or are you trying to hit singles and doubles when you get later in the draft? Uh, I think it, de- it depends. You know, we, we certainly want to have some high side, some potential in players that we take. So either, you know, if they have a, a real clear separation skill that we think can continue to enhance and get them to in, into a position to be successful. So, you know, we want to hit home runs. We want guys that have, uh, you know, a high ceiling of potential. Uh, but we also want to, you know, try and mitigate some of the risk and, and make sure that they have a realistic shot at, at, at developing into a player that can help us. Judd, really appreciate your time today, as always. And uh, I know you're a busy guy here in the next week or so. Uh, so I really appreciate your time, and uh, good luck with the draft. Thank you, guys. This is yep. great. I appreciate it. Yep. All right, thanks, thanks, Judd. thanks Judd. Judd Brackett, the Director of Amateur Scouting. Really appreciate his time. And before we talk about uh, Parisian Suter, let's talk about SodaStick.com. Go to SodaStick.com to get your original Minnesota sports-inspired goods. If you haven't seen the stuff yet, you got to check it out. Uh, one of my favorite designs uh, is the uh, all the 1980 uh, Miracle on Ice apparel that they have. And all of their apparel is screen printed here in Minnesota on super soft, comfy shirts. You will love it. And we're going to hook you up with 15% off your next order. So use the code KFN for 15% off. Uh, that is SodaStick.com, original Minnesota sports inspired goods. Use the code KFN for 15% off your next order. Pat, uh, <laughs> I think we all suspected that the possibility of Zach Parisi being bought out. I don't think anybody saw the Ryan Suter, uh, Ryan Suter bio coming. Uh, what was your initial reaction when you heard the news on Tuesday? I was I was very surprised, you know, as, like anyone else was. Um, I get it. I understand it. Um, you know, you know, you and I, Brandon, had talked about uh, transforming this team, and it was going to take a while. And and you could see what Bill Guerin was doing. Um, I think I think we also talked about the possibility. Now the possibility of maybe taking a step back before you take another step forward, uh, because of the youth that might have to jump in the lineup. A Boldy, uh, a Rossi, maybe a, a kid like Beckman. Um, you know whoever. Kalen Addison. Kalen Addison. Uh, you know, if, if Brennan Manel comes back, I, you know, who knows, right? What, what, what names are going to be there, but there might be guys that don't have the experience, um, but you see what they're trying to do. And so uh, for that, I understand it. They, they, uh, they probably see a window of when they think that they can contend. And when you look at it and you look at the age of Zach and Ryan, um, you know, I, I, I think it might be better for both players and better yeah. for the organization. I mean, obviously, Zach was pretty uh, elated and excited, and, and Suter, rightfully so, caught off guard. And, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Suter, we, we, we've heard forever about, you know, he's, he's in the owner's ear and, and basically can kind of run things the way he wants. And obviously, it, it seems over the years that Zach was very de- demanding of his, of his playing time, and maybe previous coaches. Um, couldn't control that as well as they had wanted to. And uh, obviously with Bill Guerin come in and hiring Dean Evison as the coach, I think it's been pretty apparent, Pat, that uh, Bill's going to run this locker room and, and Dean yeah. is going to run this locker room 
the way they want. And, um, it, you know, you look at I, it was just a year ago they had the, and this is before the pandemic hit, they had kind of the poster for the, the, the uh, winter classic. And it was Parisi and Suter and Koivu and Stahl and Dubnik. And it's amazing that they're all gone now. This team has gone from a reliance on older guys, uh, veteran guys, to a all-inclusive. All right? Doesn't matter who you are. You know, if you're not playing well, you're not going to play. Um, if you're not pulling on the same chain, you know, that, that everyone else is, you're not going to play. And, you know, I, I we, we don't know, you know, that, you know, a, a lot of what we th- say is speculation, but you, you can just tell what, what they're trying to do. Now, um, where will these two guys end up, right, is the next question. Um, uh, I think Ryan will have no problem getting a job. No. If I'm Zach Parisi and I'm his agent, I am. I have. I have to sell myself to other teams, right? And if he goes in with the attitude of "I'm going to vie for a top six, forget it. He's no. got a hard time finding a job or even a top nine. If I'm consulting, especially him, if he wants to be on a winner, like he right? says he does. Yes. And if if I'm consulting him, I tell him you go to a team. You tell him I'm willing to play anywhere. Uh, I understand I'm not going to get high minutes. Uh, I am, you know, I, I understand that I can also have the ability to jump up when needed. I, I should be a, um, uh, a mentor to the younger kids and he could endear himself with a team and, you know, you know, and, and end his career on the way he wants. He, he's kind of got to do what you saw in Montreal this year where they right. acquired it. They acquired Eric Stahl and, you know, you had, you had Stahl and Corey Perry in your bottom yep. six, and you're not the show anymore, and you're not going to get the minutes, but you can still and they produce were, and, and play a role. And, and they both, you know, especially Perry, played pretty pretty well in the playoffs. Yeah, oh, very well. Yeah. And uh, and Eric Stahl did too, you know. But they played less minutes. They knew their role. They bought in. Um, and, you know, I, I think things went fairly well for them. Um Zach has to do the same thing. Now, Ryan, you know, he, 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 that that's going to be an interesting one because his style of play, you know, he, he's, he, he uses his body well, doesn't overexert himself, you know. Um, you know, he, he still has some tread on the tire yeah. that you know, is going to intrigue some teams. It's all going to come down to how much money he's going to want, right? I mean, does he really want to win a championship? And then you look at four or five teams that, you know, the Vegas, uh, Tampa, Colorado, you know, Washington's of the world. Um, and or or does he want to take a little bit more money and go to, you know, a team that's quite not there yet? That that's kind of like Minnesota. Uh, I, you know, Zach, on one hand, he's not going to get a ton of money here in free agency. Nope. Let, let's be honest. Nope. Um, you know, Ryan Suter is not going to get the seven and a half AAV he had before. but. Ryan Suter is still a four million dollar player. Uh, yeah, Pat. I, I, I still think out in free agency he can get two, three years for four million dollars a year. Um, um, depending and, where, depending where, right? I mean, if it's a contender, you know. I mean, listen, we got we can't forget. Um, you can eliminate a lot of teams right away because of the flat cap and where they're at. Um, Minnesota made room for more money, but a lot of teams don't have that. Yeah. Well, and, and with these moves, you know, Pat, everyone's talking about, you know, main reason is the Wild were able to clear some salary cap space. And they were for this year, but yeah. they are, they do not have cleared salary space for the next yeah. three years. So it's not like they have all this room to go out and, and get whatever guys they want because, uh, you know, maybe if you're signing guys to one-year contracts, yes, you've got some space for this year. Um, but, you know, this is, this is going to be a – in year two, three, and four – uh, the, the Wild are going to be at a disadvantage in the National Hockey League because they're going to be playing at a salary cap much lower than anybody else. Yeah, they better hope that the cap goes up and uh, they have a little bit more room to play with. But uh, on on that point, Brandon, you know, people automatically think, oh, now they're going after Jack Eichel. Well, hold on a second. 
um, by what you just said and the, the, the cap space that they have, they, they would still, and I don't believe so, have enough. They, they got to still bring money out. Yeah. To, to bring, yeah. you know, so it's, it'd still be a Fiala or a Dumba. You're, you're 100% correct on that. Yeah. And so, I mean, and maybe that is in the works. I mean, we're going to find out, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's going to be very curious. Or at least I'll be curious to see if Eichel is moved um, on draft day or before the draft. Uh, yeah. You know, because people, these teams have to budget, you know, for what, what they have, what they need to get. Um, you know, you look at Minnesota's depth chart right now. Um, they got to bring some guys in, right? Yep. Yep. Well, and Pat, you know, in, in the salary cap era, it's always been important for young guys on their entry level deals to contribute to your team. Yeah. And let's face it, until we had Kahuro Kaprizov this year, the Wild have never really been in that situation where you've had young players making, you know, you know, close to the bare minimum and giving you contributions. Yeah. And now given the way um, the cap's gonna be the next couple of years with the wild situation, they need Boldy to play. Yeah. They they need Marco Rossi to hit. They need Kalen Addison to hit, maybe Brennan Manel if he's still on the team, you know, at a, at a smaller salary. These are the guys that are they're going to have to contribute um, for the, for this team to, to stay at the level they were at this last year and, and to move move past that. You know that's very that's very interesting because you know we all thought Boldy was going to jump in, and you know they, they you know they they held their word in saying until we think a guy is ready, he's not yep. in there. Now, do you think that oh you know we're making these moves, we may have no choice or you know. Uh, do we do we keep Boldy, you know, down in the minors for a while again? And Rossi, that would really, you know, then then they really have to go out and just find some some guys that are gonna, you know, play a year and and then move on from them. I, well, I mean, I mean, at least they have the salary cap space for one year where you can you can wait probably a year on Boldy or you know probably even more so Rossi. I think Boldy's going to be in the lineup at some point this year. Yeah. So uh, Rossi, given his situation, you don't know what you're going to get out of him just based off of missing an entire year and coming off of having COVID. Um, but uh, you can you can get away with going out and get a Paul Stasny, and he's your temporary fill-in for a year or two. You're not going to be – you know, past the big Eichel trade, you're not going to, I don't think, commit to guys for three, four, five years. You're not going to be gotta go that, one that. year. Got to go yeah. one year again, right? Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, and now we got to look back at, you know, we didn't think uh, Nick Bonino or Ian Cole or even Johansson, I don't know what his situation is. Um, you know, are, are they possibilities to come back? You know, I, I, I think Ian Cole will be back. I think they'll probably go out and get another defenseman. Uh, Alec Martinez's name kind of intrigues me a bit there. Oh, I'd love to get him. I can't afford him. Can can you? He's he's making five and a half. Ooh, you know, it's it depends for how long. Yeah, I mean, you know, and the other aspect of this is that not only have they cleared a lot of space, they could still potentially clear more space here, Pat. One, just because, uh, you know, with with Suter and Parisi gone now, you're now able to protect two guys that you didn't think you're going to protect in the expansion draft. So a uh, Matt Dumba is going to be protected now. Um, you're going to be able to protect the Nico Sturm that maybe you didn't think you could protect before, which so now really your options, if you're Seattle, in my opinion, is assuming the wild go seven, three, one, and assuming they pick the same guys I do, which I think at this point is pretty clear. Yep. The guy, the guys that are going to be available for Seattle are Victor Rask, Carson Soucy, and then one of your two goaltenders. Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming you keep Talbot, but if Rask goes, that's $4 million off the books. If Soucy goes, I'd rather keep Soucy because I think he's still a good value, but that's almost $3 million. So there's still a scenario where more salaries is going to get shed yeah, here soon. Right, right. A um, lot of moving parts. A lot of moving parts. And yeah. Uh, but you know, I, you know, you, you you've got to be you got to be excited about, you know, just looking forward. You can kind of see their vision of what they're trying to do, and 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 I think all fans should be excited about it. Interesting. What's going to happen with the Central Division coming up here too, Pat? Where uh, the Blackhawks just traded Duncan Keith to Edmonton. Um, we talked about it last week, Vladimir Tarasenko requesting a trade from St. Louis. Uh, I just saw the report that Gabriel Landeskog is disappointed in his contract talks with Colorado. Yeah. Um, Grubauer is a free agent in Colorado. And I'm just kind of looking at Colorado's situation. Man, Colorado, they're still going to have a, a window wide open just because they're going to have superstars. But 
they kind of missed this window here where you had Nathan McKinnon at you know six million dollars and change when he's going to be a ten million dollar plus player in yeah. his next contract. They're going to have to pay Kale McCarr a massive raise at some point in the next year or so. Um, they're already paying Ranton in over nine million dollars. I don't know if they can afford to pay Landeskog the amount he wants if they're just looking towards the future. Because if you do make Landeskog eight million, nine million dollars, man, you're going to have four four salaries and and face it, you know they're all good players, but you're going to have four contracts, to, huge contracts devoted to those four guys. What, what are you going to have to build around them? Uh, it, it it's very difficult, and and we saw you know we saw a different Colorado team when a McKinnon was out, when a McCarr was out. Um, they're a different team. Now, yeah. with, with that number one line, that kind of puts every team way back on their heels. It, 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 and and um, then their their secondary looked looked faster, you know, if you know what I mean. When yeah. you when you put when you put that secondary guys um, as guys that had to win you games. It, it, you know, it, it, there was a drop off. There was a drop off. Yeah. And, um, you know, if, if they lose a land of sky, boy, they, you know, they, they lose, you know, a, a big piece of that top line. And, you know, they're not the same team. Yeah. I mean, Colorado is still going to get to be good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I, I feel like they really missed this two year window here of McKinnon at cheap, McCarr at cheap. Um, Cause eventually those two are going to take a huge percentage of your salary cap. And it's going to make it very difficult for them to to get the depth around them they want. Yeah, and I mean, look at you know we we had them pegged as going to the cup. I mean, uh, we thought they were that good, but yep. it goes to show how hard it is to get to the to to get there and win. You need everything, and uh, and what they had, hey, you didn't make it. It still wasn't enough, and whatever that it is, whether it be you know a, a, you know a, a another player attitude goaltending whatever the case may be um they didn't have it so until you get there you don't have it uh probably next week when i talk to you pat will be a day or two before the nhl draft so maybe we can get more into it next week okay. but as, as far as we know you know we'll, we'll have expansion draft stuff to talk about at that point too oh. and you never you never know there might be a big trade uh so i did want to talk a little draft now while we have some time um you know Last year, I really got into researching the draft, and it was a lot easier because the Wild had the number nine pick, and you can just kind of go over guys that are potentially top 10, and you can put a lot more research in. Now with picks 21 and 25, there's so many more players you have to look over and research, and I, I, feel, like I, <laughs> I feel like I don't have as great of a, a gauge on these players as I did last year just because it's just impossible to give them as much attention as I did. But my my vibe right now that I'm getting, Pat, is – this draft is just not nearly as good as it was last year. Um, you know, you got Owen Power as the number one pick, who I think everyone everyone thinks is going to be a, a legit top four defenseman in the league, but I don't know if that's a, a, a guaranteed superstar. I think there's been better number one overall picks yeah. in the past, and you can talk about him in a second because you've seen Michigan play plenty. But, uh, man, I just uh, I feel like the depth here, not necessarily the depth, but especially the high-end talent, those the top ten, I think Marco Rossi, who went nine to the wild last year. The number one could have been, might've been the number one pick in this draft. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Craig button, who I, I trust a lot. Um, been in the game for a long time. General manager uh, works for TSN. Now um, he came out and said, um, there's not a guy in the first round that should sign. Okay. That is ready to yep. play. That yep. probably could play a little bit, but not ready thinks they all should go back. Um, and I, you know, quite frankly, I, I, I agree with them, but even if you look, Brandon, look at uh, Lafreniere from the Rangers. Uh, Hughes, uh, who went to Hughes and, and, and Capo, uh, Caco uh, with the Rangers, yep. uh, their draft years, all struggled initially. And it just goes to show it takes a lot of, it takes time uh, to mature. You're playing with a, you know, in the best league in the world against older, bigger men and, uh, and getting acclimated to that. It's, it's not easy for a young kid. And, uh, you know, un unless you are a McDavid or a McKinnon who had, you know, that something extra, uh, it, it, it takes a while. So 
Um, yeah, it, 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 this, this year's draft, uh, certainly not what we've seen in the past. Uh, let's talk about some of the guys in the top 10, specifically that I, I know you've seen, Pat, yep. uh, because you got the three Michigan guys. Yep. Uh, Owen Power expected to go number one to Buffalo. Uh, Baneers could go as high as number two. Yeah, um, we saw him uh, you know, as, as a youngster in the World Juniors tournament, one of the youngest players in the, turn- in the tournament. I really? thought he played played very well in that tournament. Yep. And then, you know, and then Kent Johnson, uh, right now a center, might end up being a center or a wing once he gets to the NHL. It seems from reading about him, Pat, that he's the guy that has a lot of high end potential, maybe more so than a lot of the guys in this draft, but a little bit inconsistent. Veneers is kind of thought of maybe not the highest ceiling, but the most sure thing in yep. terms of like that, that guy's going to be a number two center in the National Hockey League. What are your thoughts on the three Michigan guys who all could go top 10 here? Well, I, I, I you know, I, I, all three of them, um, if I'm the Minnesota Gophers, I want them to sign. Um, they are yeah. that good. And and Johnson um, makes, he makes plays. He, he is going to be, uh, uh, a lot of people really think that he should be drafted higher than where he's rated right now. I think he's, I don't know, uh, top 15 or so. Um, but he's a really, really good player. Beneers is, is, is dynamic. Uh, uh, and you know, he's going to have a good career, uh, obviously. And, you know, own powers just, I mean, he's a monster and he skates well. Um, you know, if, if there is a sure thing, he's probably the guy. You know, I find this fa- this draft fascinating. I, I think this draft is going to separate the, the the true, um, you know, guys that have eyes for talent in terms of guys like Judd Brackett, directors of amateur scouting. It's going to separate kind of the men from the boys. I think in terms of scouting, because you know, you had leagues like the OA- OHL that were shut down because of yeah. the pandemic. Uh, you know, if you go online and try to find highlights of some of these guys, Pat, you're watching highlights from two years ago. Which, let's face right. it, when you're when you're 16 years old, there's a huge amount of development. So there's probably more projecting in this draft compared to just seeing what you saw a couple of months ago. Uh, I, I think it's it's a tricky year for drafting, which might be good for some of the guys who are really keen at being able to project guys out. Um, but also I could see a situation where if you're the wild, you've got picks 21 and 25, and I kind of view it as a weaker draft that, you know, if, if you're able to, to move one of those or maybe both of those picks and, and bring in something else, I, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Um, Minnesota has a kid, uh, who's going to get drafted. I think he's 13th right now on the list. He's in that range. Yep. Yep. Chaz, Chaz Lucius. Yep. Uh, I was told by some people that he might be the best player on Minnesota next year. Um, that, well, and even, in, and even in this draft, Pat, yep. I, I, from what I've read is this guy might be the best goal scorer of them right. all. Yeah. You know, obviously right. he had, he had the injury stuff going on. And, yeah. At the end of the year and had a little COVID yeah. and, but, you know, whatever, but, um, and then there's another kid out of Grand Rapids, Jack Pert, yes. um, you know, who's going to St. Cloud to, so, you know, two local kids, um, uh, who's supposed to be a, a you know, a stud player, um, and he's going to get drafted real high. So, um, you know, Minnesota has a little flavor in that first round also. Well, and even there, uh, I don't know if, I don't think go in the first round, I would really like the wild and maybe there's a Homer in me kind of a little bit, uh, Sorry. there's a kid. There's a defenseman named Scott Morrow who played at Shattuck St. Mary's. And, okay. you know, I understand when you're watching him, his competition is not the same as, you know, someone playing in the SHL in Europe, right, against grown men. Right. I, I understand there's a difference. But this kid's got high-end potential, Pat. You watch the way he stick handles the fuck as a defenseman and, and just uh, his ability to, you go on. to, move, to oh. move on skates. Uh, I, I know, you know, the concern about him is – he might give up some defensive things and I'd have some, de- he's so aggressive and so offensive that he gives up things defensively. I'll take that. But, but when you get past the first round, I'm going after high end potential guys, Pat, and I'll try to try to coach them up and work on that aspect of the game. Um, he's a guy that I would love to see the wild go after in the second round, or if he somehow drops to one of their two third round picks. Yeah, I, I have not seen him play. Um, but I, I certainly trust your judgment on that. Uh, where's he going to school? Do you know? Uh, he's going to college somewhere. I think it's somewhere out east. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, listen, you got you got to take, you know, look at, it's hard to find good talent. It really is. I mean, you, you even look in the National Hockey League now, and we, we look at some third-line guys, and oh, man, 
you know, this guy's just a checker, you know, this can't score, can't this, um, you gotta go, you gotta, you know, you gotta get the talent. And, uh, and, you know, I think Jed Brackett does, I think the draft last year was terrific. I thought they got a yep. lot of really good, good young players. You know, we said the Russian kid that I'm not going to pronounce. You can, um, you know, Kustantinov. Yeah. Kustantinov. Thank you. I did it pretty good. Kustantinov. Yeah. Yeah. Kustantinov. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I, I just think you, you've got to get, uh, you got to get as much and as uh, talent as you can. Pat, I will talk to you next week. When I talk to you next week on this episode, uh, we'll know who, uh, is a member of the Seattle Kraken and we'll be leading up to the draft and free agency. There's a lot going on here in the next couple of weeks. Look forward to it. Thanks, Brandon. All right. Thanks, Pat. He's Pat Micheletti. I'm Brandon Molesky. This has been another episode of beyond the pod. Of course, as always brought to you by sodastick.com. Just use the code KFAN for 15% off your next order at sodastick.com. We'll talk to you next week right here. I'm beyond the pod. Bye. <laughs>